Hi, this is Dr. Christopher Miller, and welcome to a lecture on early to medieval Shvetambara history. This lecture will follow Paul Dundas's book, The Jains, pages 129 through 149. In the previous lecture, we discussed the early to medieval Digambara history. And in doing so, we did introduce some of the westward movement that took place in the north that included those who would become the Shvetambaras. We didn't get into too much detail about this Shvetambara history, however, and in this lecture, we're going to dive straight into it. As you see here pictured on the title card, we have some Shvetambara monks. The caption underneath the picture says Shravak priests. It's calling these people priests, right? And so what we can see, as we discussed in the very first lecture, the Christian terminology and the imperial terminology of Western empire is being applied onto this culture of Shvetambaras, and in this case, Shvetambara monks, right? And even the word monk is a Christian word, right, to describe them. But we'll see that the, although they are religious leaders within the Shvetambara tradition, these quote-unquote monks are something very unique to the Shvetambara tradition, to the Jain tradition, and to religious traditions in general. So we see them here donning their white clothes because they are the Shvetambara, Shveta, they are clad by, this, by their white clothing, as opposed to the Digambara who are clad or clothed by the sky, right? So we'll refer to them throughout as monks or something along those lines, but keep in mind that they have very unique features, the, the ascetics within the Jain tradition, and in future lectures we will also discuss in more detail some of the intricacies of Jain asceticism of the monks and nuns, the so-called monks and nuns, and we'll look a little bit closer at what, ma what makes them so unique. Now we will focus specifically on Shvetambara history more broadly, and let's dive right in. The topics that we'll look at are first, we'll look at some of the Shvetambara eminent exalters, as Dundas calls them, the Prabhavakas, those who have shared the Jain tradition in particularly unique and powerful ways, in ways that connect all the way into the present. So who are these people, these philosophers and monks? We'll also look at what is known as the temple dwelling or yati shvetambaras. So just as with the digambaras, as we discussed in the previous lecture, the shvetambaras had a tradition of temple dwelling ascetics eventually. They no longer wandered all over the place, but they started to take up residence within temples for various reasons. Some of them did. So we'll look at the debates and tensions between those who decided to dwell in temples and those who decided to continue to wander around and not take up residency in temples. We'll then look at two significant Shvetambara quote-unquote families, as Dundas calls them, or gacha, what are known as gacha. So these are sects within the Shvetambara tradition that break out, or families of, of groups of monks and nuns and lay people who eventually split apart, even though they still retain a fundamental Jain commitment or commitment to the Jain lifestyle, but in their own particular ways. We'll also look at Shvetambara specifically relations with Muslims. So the Shvetambaras originally remained in the north and moved west. And as we know, or maybe we don't know, the Muslims eventually in medieval India started to come in through the northwest and colonize India. And therefore this relationship between this invading culture and the Shvetambara culture, what was, which was there, created uh, certain relations that were both positive and negative between these two religious groups. And we'll end briefly by discussing the Shvetambara views on caste or jati. So to give an overview as we dive into this, as Dundas points out, up to about 1000 of the common era, Shvetambara history is very difficult to piece together. Most of the data that we have, as he points out, comes from the hagiographies or the hagiographies of teachers, quote unquote, prabhavana. Okay, so hagiographies, again, are stories of saintly people within traditions. So we have them in the Christian tradition and in other religious traditions, and we have them within the Jain tradition. So the data that we have about Shvetambara history in its earlier history comes from these saintly stories. And because they're hagiographies, they're not historical texts per se, we, we look at them with, with the eye of, of, on the one hand, being helpful for understanding what may have been in Jain history, and on the other hand, as, as in some ways, 
being told as stories of saints that may not all be historically true. Nevertheless, there were teachers, very important teachers, two of whom we'll look at right now within the Jain tradition, within the Shvetambara tradition, who shared what is known as Prabhavana, which means the spreading of the Jain religion through good deeds. So these teachers did the following eight good deeds in some mixture or some way, shape or form. For example, a teacher's Prabhavana could be that they have really great scriptural knowledge. So we saw in previous lectures how Jain's scripture is a result of Mahavira's original teachings and the sound that came off of his body, which was then translated either by his disciples, if you're in the Digambara tradition, or just by humanity in general and received by humanity in general, right? And there are a lot of scriptures and they're very detailed and we've gone through some of the scriptural knowledge in some of these lectures. For one to have a high degree of scriptural knowledge requires a lot of study and commitment to those scriptures. And so if one possesses that scriptural knowledge <clears throat> and shares that scriptural knowledge, they are considered to be giving prabhavana. It's a good deed. You're spreading Jain religion through scriptural knowledge, which is related to number two, preaching. You preach, you share through speech, through public discourse, the Jain tradition, the Jain religion in various ways, oftentimes based on that scriptural knowledge, right? You're sharing the Jain tradition in ways that are very powerful and public and keep the tradition moving forward through history. Also related to that is number three, debating. One form of prabhavana is the ability to debate well. If you can debate well, you can uphold the Jain Dharma, the Jain tradition, the Jain tradition in the eyes of the public in the eyes of other religious traditions, such as Buddhism and Vedic Hinduism. You're able to maintain your position of nonviolence, for example, argue for why nonviolence is important and continue to have that teaching go through history, right? So be able to defend what you believe in through debating. That is seen as a prabhavana, something that is a good deed, obviously, within any religion and specifically within the Jain tradition. The fourth is astrological prediction. So these teachers were able to make astrological predictions that were very helpful for especially lay people who wanted to know what's gonna happen in life. We all have probably at one time in our life or maybe on an ongoing basis, looked at our own astrological predictions, our signs to see what's gonna to happen to us this week, what's gonna to happen to us, why did this happen, why did that happen, to try to figure out what's gonna happen in the future. So in medieval and early India, there was a fascination with astrological prediction because for example, it's good to know when to have a child. When should a child be born? Uh, when is this gonna happen? When is that gonna happen? If you're someone who can give a good astrological prediction, you are considered to be giving prabhavana, another good deed through the Jain religion, someone reliable who you can go to within the Jain religion to understand your astrological chart and what will happen to you. Number five, asceticism. So if a Jain teacher of any kind can perform asceticism to a high degree and consistently, this is seen to be something quite virtuous. They are not only burning their own karma, but they're showing other people within the Jain tradition that it is possible. By denying one's body certain needs, even food, water, sex, and so forth, you are considered to be burning your karma in Jainism. And through doing so, by eliminating all your desires, and all the things that cause all the, the greed and, and deception that humans tend to partake in, you're modeling behavior for the rest of the Jain tradition and for the world at large that it is possible. It's something that is possible to do and that other people should try to follow your example. This is considered a prabhavana. You would be respected for this. The sixth and seventh are, are related, mastery of spells and mastery of magic power. So there's a power, as we've discussed before, in sound, especially through mantra, through being, through being able to pronounce particular spells, memorize spells, and produce magic power as a result for a, a number of things, you would be respected for having this power. For example, num in number seven, the mastery of magic power, one of the things that it is most emphasized is the ability to make things happen through your magic power. One example that Dundas gives is Siddhasena, who, as one of the giving some sort of prabhavana, 
makes Parshva, as you remember, as you'll recall, as the 23rd Tirthankara, appear out of a Shiva icon by, pr by pronouncing a Sanskrit hymn. So Siddhasena does one of these mantras, he performs one of these mantras, and out of Shiva, one of the great gods of Hinduism, Parshva appears, the 23rd Tirthankara, out of that icon, right? That's a display of power to overcome a Hindu god and to make a Jain Tirthankara arise in its place is a very powerful thing. So that would be seen as Prabhavana. The eighth Prabhavana is literary skill. So skill in literature, writing, reading, and the production of, of, of scripture and the reproduction of scripture. In order for the tradition to continue, there have to be people trained not only in the Prakrit and Sanskrit languages, but they have to be able to reproduce that literature and share that literature with others. So to have literary skill ties in back with number one, scriptural knowledge, to have uh, knowledge and skill with certain texts and genres of Jain texts to keep the tradition moving forward and to teach others. So as we can see, Prabhavana is a very important aspect of Shvetambara history for people who have all of these eight things or some mix of these eight skills, they would be given great respect within the Jain tradition. One of those people, as you see to the right here, is Hema Chandra. Hema Chandra is here featured in this photograph and we'll talk more about him. There are two specific eminent exalters that we will talk about. One is Hema Chandra, as you see in number two here, who lived from the 11th to 12th century in Gujarat. A, a, prabha, a prabhavaka is someone who performs prabhavana. So Hema Chandra and then number one here, Haribhadra, are both considered prabhavakas, eminent exalters, those who perform prabhavana to a very high and respectable degree. So first we're going to look at Haribhadra, and there were two of them in Jain history, as Dundas points out, although the Jain tradition often just considers them to be one person. And then we're going to look at Hema Chandra, who lived later from the 11th to 12th century in what is now Gujarat. And here you see another image of Hema Chandra to, right, to the right, obviously and clearly doing something with Prabhavana, holding some scriptures, teaching, right, in a very respectable way, and sharing the Jain knowledge with the rest of the world. And he's still respected to this day. <clears throat> so we begin with Haribhadra. Again, Haribhadra is often continue, considered to be within the Jain tradition, one person. Although, as Dundas points out, there are two different versions of Haribhadra and he produced in many ways, a lot of great Jain literature that is still read and respected to this day. But here I'll show you just briefly the two different Haribhadras that may have been in the Jain tradition. The first is Haribhadra known as Yakani Putra, as you can see here in the first bullet point under number one, Yakani Putra, which means the son or the spiritual son of Yakani. This Haribhadra, as you see in the image to the right, was initially a Brahmin. And you recall that the Brahmins were priests of the highest order within Vedic Hindu society in North India. As a Brahmin, he would have been opposed to the Jain tradition as well as the Buddhist tradition because those two traditions rejected the Vedic sacrifice and everything that the Brahmin priests did, right? And in rejecting that life, the Brahmins would reject them, right? Because they're challenging everything that they do. Now, this Haribhadra, Yakini Putra, being a Brahmin priest, nevertheless, once overheard Yakini, a nun who you see pictured to the right here, reciting Jain scripture and mantra. And in hearing that sound and listening to the teachings and eventually interacting with Yakini, he actually became converted. He was so compelled by what he heard that he was converted by Yakini to become a Jain himself. Okay, so he, he converted to Jainism. And as you see to the left, he's holding onto the pillar and he's now looking at and, and adoring the image of Mahavira in the Samavasarana as recreated within the Jain temple system. And so the first of the Haribhadras is Yakini Putra, the spiritual son of Yakini, who was himself converted by a female, a nun, Yakini, to the Jain tradition by hearing the Jain teachings from her own mouth. So he became the son, the spiritual son of Yakini. Number two is Virahanka, Haribhadra Virahanka. Virahanka, as you see in the second bullet point here, means, quote unquote, having loss as a distinguishing mark. 
as Dundas points out. He probably lived in the sixth century of the common era and his name having lost as a distinguishing mark, Virahanka, is important because it refers to the story of his life. Vira, Virahanka's nephew was in a, was killed by Buddhists. He was studying with Buddhists and through this study with the Buddhists, he was trying to figure, they were trying to figure out, uh, you know, Buddhist teachings and so on and so forth as Jains, and they were discovered. And so his nephews were killed by the Buddhists, right, which really upset uh, Haribhadra Virahanka, who was a Jain, right? And he then went and debated these Buddhists himself, showed the primacy of the Jain doctrine, right? So he's debating, he's showing his literary skill and his scriptural knowledge defeats the Buddhists that killed his nephews in, in debate, and then ends up becoming, uh, ends up killing the Buddhists uh, himself, and then gets into a lot of trouble, right? And his teacher then makes him do a really long penance for killing the Buddhists, and his name then becomes Virahanka, because he has lost as a distinguishing mark, he has lost his nephews, and he is very sad about this. So Virahanka, having lost as a distinguishing mark, shows also that one, even though one experiences loss, revenge is not necessarily the answer. And having killed the Buddhist that killed his nephews, he had to do a long period of penance to pay for that. Nevertheless, respected for his literary skill and his skill in debate. So those are the two Haribhadras, respected within the Jain tradition, have produced quite a bit of respectable literature and philosophy and yoga within the Jain tradition. And the second of the Prabhavakas or eminent exalters, as I mentioned before, is Hema Chandra, who you can see here pictured to the right, holding onto some scripture, sharing scripture with the Jain community all the way to this day, so still respected also. A dominant concern, as Dunnis points out, in Hema Chandra's biography is his relationship to Jaya Simha Siddharaja and success, his successor nephew, Kumarapala of the Chalukya dynasty. So there was a king named Jayasema Siddharaja, right? And Hema Chandra was incredibly intelligent, had great literary skill, was, had knowledge of the scriptures, as well as other religious traditions. And he became the court historian for the king Siddharaja, right? So he's being patronized by the king. This is not an uncommon thing. We saw it in the south with the Digambaras. And here in the north, Hema Chandra has become the court historian for Siddharaja, the king. That's all fine and good. However, Siddharaja at one point gets wind that his nephew Kumarapala, whose name you also see here, was going to destroy him, defeat him, and take his place and take over the kingdom, right? So this rumor goes to Siddharaja that this is going to happen. Now, Siddharaja, being a great king and having defend, to defend his power in his life, of course, freaks out about this, as anyone would. And he sends orders for his nephew, Kumarapala, to be killed, to be taken out, because he doesn't want himself to be killed. So it's kind of in self-defense, as he, as he thinks, right? And Kumarapala is scared. And Hema Chandra, knowing Kumarapala, the nephew of Siddharaja, the king that he works for, takes Kumarapala and hides him underneath a bunch of, guess what, Jain doctrine. So a pile of, of scriptures. He hides him under a pile of scriptures while the king's guards are looking for him and eventually smuggles him out and away from the kingdom where he is safe until Siddharaja, eventually living out his life, dies. And then, of course, Kumarapala comes back and then he takes the throne, right? So we already see that Hema Chandra has been able to prevent some form of unnecessary violence. If Kumarapala was indeed going to take Siddharaja out, he stopped that violence from taking place. He hid Kumarapala, stopped him from being killed, hid him away. And now that Siddharaja got to live out his life as the king, Kumarapala has come back and now will take over the kingdom and the throne. So Kumarapala, of course, was quite thankful to Hema Chandra for saving his life, as well as for eventually allowing him to be restored to the king the kingship within what was Siddharaja's kingdom. And he continues to employ Hema Chandra, who writes a book that is famous within the Jain tradition and still referred to to this day, known as the Yoga Shastra, 
which you see in bullet point number two. We can see the word yoga here. Yoga here referring to something like discipline, right? The yoga shastra are the teachings or the texts of yoga, of discipline, that were intended to teach Kumarapala the Jain way of life, of nonviolence and so forth, right? He had, Hemachandra had himself prevented violence from occurring between Siddharaja and Kumarapala. And now he's written a text for Kumarapala to share those teachings with Kumarapala and the Jain way of life, right? So he's sharing with Kumarapala this Jain way of life, but it's important to note that Siddharaja and Kumarapala were of course Vedic or Hindu kings. And so what Hemachandra is doing is sharing this Jain way of life with this Hindu kingship. So he has a, a pretty profound influence. How does that manifest? Well, Kumarapala eventually gives up meat himself, right? He becomes vegetarian as all Jains are, right? To, to prevent violence to animals. And he even banned at certain times animal slaughter within his own kingdom. That's a pretty profound step for a king to take, right? And we can see how the Jain influence was very powerful and moved Kumarapala to engage in producing policy, structural policy, to ban animal slaughter as well as himself giving up meat. So there's individual change as well as sort of a structural change within the kingdom that was affected by the Jain teachings as propounded by Hema Chandra in the Yoga Shastra, okay? And nevertheless, as Dundas points out, it's important to keep in mind that Siddharaja, while, while he was alive, and then Kumarapala who followed him, nevertheless remained Shaiva devotees, right? They remained devotees of Shiva, although they incorporated the Jain way of life into their kingdom and into their own lives, right? So we can see that the Jain tradition wasn't necessarily concerned with always converting people, although they, of course, converted people in, but they were more concerned with seeing people live through their action, through their ethical action, through nonviolence, the Jain way of life. And Hemachandra is very well respected for this, among other things, for sharing this. Okay, so those are the two main Prabhavakas who taught Prabhavana in the Jain tradition. Now we're going to move to look at some other issues within the Shvetambara northern tradition during the medieval history of, the Jain, of Jainism. Okay, so there's a medieval tension between the ideal of the forest and the temple dwelling yati, as you see in the first bullet point here. Just like with the Digambaras, it was originally thought if you were a Jain ascetic, a monk or a nun, that you shouldn't get too comfortable within your lodging or, or a dwelling because you would accrue karma, you would have attachment, possession, and a need for these things. Instead, you should be out wandering around, making your life difficult, burning all of your karma, not taking more than you need. So there's a medieval tension in the same way as there was with the Digambaras, or in a similar way, between this ideal of a monk or nun who should be wandering out in the forest and out in society without taking any permanent dwelling place, and what is known as the temple dwelling yati. So I have an image here to the right. Here's the yati who may have lived in the temple, right? Taking up residence in the temple as opposed to the wandering monk who you see carrying all of his possessions that he owns right in his, his own hands, walking around with his food that he's begged for or his alms that he's been given by the lay people and his broom and so forth. And that is it, right? So. The ideal within the Jain tradition, generally speaking, is that you would be this wandering monk or nun because you would not have attachments. However, in the medieval period, there, and in the, the early and late classical period, there were these yatis, these people who, these monks and nuns who started to take up dwellings in the temples, right? So practically speaking, as Dennis points out, in the fourth century, most, or by the fourth century, most of these monks and nuns were temple dwelling, right? They were it made more sense and it was easier to maintain the Jain tradition by keeping the monks and nuns within the Jain temples or some form of permanent lodging because there they could teach and so on and so forth and propound the Jain tradition. And it would be more compelling for someone to even become a monk or nun because they knew they didn't have to wander and live that very difficult life. Nevertheless, those that did take up dwelling in the temple were accused of not wandering as you see in bullet point number three. They weren't making their life hard enough. They were not begging for food anymore. Instead, they were just receiving the alms 
right there that was being prepared around and in the temple. It was easier for them to get food. They weren't making it difficult enough on themselves. They were participating in rituals. So Jain ritual, as we'll see, starts to develop in the late classical, early medieval period in a future lecture. And they were participating in rituals, right? Monks should not, according to the ideal of the Jain tradition within the Shvetamaras, be participating in rituals. And they also shouldn't be, as you see in bullet point number three, having dancing girls in the temple, which they did. And what I mean by dancing girls is some form of entertainment that would take place also in Hindu temples. These, just to have anyone dancing, these dancers around, would be some form, seen as some form of perhaps temptation that would draw one out of one's commitment to celibacy or even create thoughts of going beyond one's commitment to celibacy, which would go against the vows that the Jain monks and nuns take, right? So all of these things were happening in the temple and therefore the, a lot of the Shvetambaras would, uh, would, would, would critique this, this way of life, right? Nevertheless, as Dundas points out, as you see in bullet point number four, the Cheta Sutras, these texts, gave exceptions to when a monk or nun was allowed to live in a temple or take some form of lodging, right? Two of those exceptions were in case of dangerous situations, right? Whether attacks or so on and so forth, or for some form of learning and teaching, right? So if they wanted to take time to study. And a lot of this would happen during the monsoon season, as we'll see during the four month monsoon season, these monks would take up residency within temples to avoid dangerous situations, to avoid the weather and to study and to take time to study scripture and teach and so on and so forth. Well, eventually with the temple dwelling institution with the yatis, this becomes more of a permanent thing, not just a thing during the monsoon. Cheda in Sanskrit, which you see the Cheda Sutras here, comes from the verbal root chid, which can mean to break, right? So in some cases you could break rules if you want to think about it that way for particular reasons, but then how far do you stretch that? Well, that's the question that comes up. The intent, what intention do you have? This debate leads to internal divisions within the Jain tradition. And that is where we get what are known as the gachas, right? So there's argument about whether or not monks and nuns should be in temples permanently or not, as among other things. That, of course, leads to splits. These become the gachas within the Jain tradition. Gacha, as I mentioned before, can mean something like family. It's a group of ascetics often supported by families of lay people. So they're teaching lay people and they split up according to their own rules and, and, and traditions and understanding of Jain doctrine and interpretation of Jain doctrine. How extreme do we have to be? Right. As Dundas points out, from an early date within the Shvetambaras, ascetics, monks and nuns, were already internally dividing into different branches and groups known as gana. We saw this word before, a troop or a sangha community, right? A gana or a sangha. By the fourth century CE, as you see in bullet point number two, there, although there was no early Shvetambara line, lineage, four kulas, or what these are also known as families or communities of ascetics, emerge. So by the fourth century, we see these four, the Chandra, the Nivrti, the Vidyadhara, which included Haribhadra, who we just looked at, the Prabhavaka, and Nagendra. So we have these four kulas, these four, by the fourth century, we have four quote-unquote families or communities of ascetics that are all Shvetambaras, but have different interpretations and different leaders and teachers about how Jain doctrine ought to be followed and practiced. The Gana and the Kula, as you see in bullet point number three, are eventually replaced by what is known as the gacha or family in the medieval period. And this is where lay support really begins to pick up. As you'll recall from the previous lecture, as the, in the north, the Jains moved to the west, they ended up in cities like Mathura and Vallabhi. And they, these were great commercial centers with great economic prosperity and the lay people being prosperous the lay Jain people being prosperous, began to support the ascetic community in these particular areas, in these particularly powerfully, powerful economic centers. So these become gachas, families of, of ascetics and lay people who are working together. The ascetics are modeling the Jain way of life, showing that they are 
trying to work towards liberation, propounding the teachings of the Jain tradition and so on. And the lay converts are practicing as best they can as householders and supporting generously these, these ascetics and keeping them going, building temples and so on and so forth. There are two particularly important gacha. The first is the Karatara gacha. As Dundas points out, the Karatara are quote unquote, particularly sharp witted in debate, right? Particularly sharp witted so they can think fast and respond quickly in debate. And as you'll recall, being good at debate is one of the qualities that is well respected within the Jain tradition as, as someone who would be sharing prabhavana, right? So they're really good at defending their doctrine and that's what their name comes from. They were established in the 11th century of the common era by someone named Vardhamana. And Vardhamana, of course, is the same name as Mahavira. Mahavira was born as Vardhamana. You remember, it means to expand and it meant to, that he expanded the wealth of his family when he was born. What's unique about Vardhamana is that he left one of these temple dwelling teachers. His teacher was a temple dwelling monk, one of these yatis. He left that temple dwelling teacher in order to wander to become a more hardcore ascetic, to not have all of the comfort at home. Well, of course, when you perform asceticism to a higher degree than someone else, someone else, that's seen as something respectable. So he left the temple to wander and got a lot of respect for this and founded in the 11th century, what became the Karatara Gacha, the particularly sharp-witted, right? He wanted to argue that it's more important to wander and have a difficult life than take up a dwelling within a, a, a lodging house or a temple. Later on, two other important Karatara Suris, these Suris are some of the highest respected teachers within the Jain tradition, continued this tradition and are well respected and well known for that. These two are Janavalaba, who in the 11th century also did something similar. He read Shvetambara texts, right? So the Shvetambara canon had already been established, as we recall, at the Council of Vallabhi and in Mathura. He, he read these Shvetambara texts and he realized, again, he looked at his teacher's way of life and thought, my teacher is not living the Jain tradition as, as, as an ascetic should, as difficult as an ascetic should. And this is something we'll see, it's, it's a, throughout the Jain history is a recommitment to ascetic practice and making life difficult, right? Jinnavalaba said, we can do better than this. And he is respected for living his ascetic life, right? So he, he's doing this prabhavana. He's, he's stepping up the game in terms of a commitment to asceticism. Number two, Jinnadatta, who lived in the 11th and 12th century, so a little bit later, was known for performing miracles, right? Remember we said having power or spiritual power power with mantra and spells and such is something that's re well respected. He was known for that. He was known to raise the dead. So in the hagiographies, there's a mention of raising the dead. And another important thing from a practical standpoint is he converted Muslims from Islam to the Jain tradition. And for this and other reasons, Janadatta, who you see pictured here to the right in a temple today, is still the most celebrated of these suris, of these great teachers of the Karatara Gacha and remains relevant into the present. And so you can see obviously that the image here of Janadatta Suri is being respected uh, in the temple. It has flowers on it and it's very beautiful and adorned by all the things that even a Tirtankara would be adorned with, the celestial beings and all of the all of the gold and colors and so forth. The second of the two gachas that were very important was the tapa gacha, which was established, as you see here in the first bullet point in 1228 by Jagachandra Suri. So another Suri, very respected teacher within the Jain Shvetambara tradition. Jagachandra Suri was said to be the 44th teacher in a direct line that goes all the way back to Mahavira. Making such a claim is not unlike the claim that is made in the Catholic Church, for example, that the Pope somehow has a connection that goes all the way back to 
Christ, right? So essentially what Jagachandra Suri has done is produced a lineage that goes back, that connects himself all the way back to the first and most respected teacher of contemporary Jainism, which is Mahavira. That's a, that's a very bold claim to make, and that is what the Tapa Gacha believe, right? Where does the name Tapa come from, Tapa Gacha? Number, bullet point number two, you can see it's a title that was given to the Gacha by a king who witnessed the austerities of Jagachandra Suri. As you will recall, to perform austerity, asceticism, to deny your body, to fast for long periods of time and deny basic human desires is seen as a respectable thing within the Jain tradition and it impressed others even outside of the Jain tradition. The word tapa comes from the verbal root tap, which means to heat because those austerities cause your body to heat up and purify you and release your soul. So the name tapa is a very powerful way of acknowledging the power of these austerities that Jagachandra Suri undertook and gave him great respect among his followers. One member of the Tapa Gacha, Dharma Sagara, as you see in bullet point number three, was harsh towards Jinnah Vallabha. So let me go back to the previous slide. Jinnah Vallabha again, number one here, was in the 11th century, the teacher or Suri who read Shvetambra texts, realized his teacher's way of life was incorrect, and left and became part of the Karata Gacha, or was kind of self-initiated on his own because he left one teacher and went to another, went into another lineage, okay? According to Dharma Sagara of the Tapa Gacha, this is not okay because essentially the Karata Gacha with a teacher like this is fabricating its descent. It's left a lineage and created its own lineage and claims to be the correct lineage, right? Well, in a way, they're pointing out, hey, you're fabricating your descent from Mahavira. You're fabricating your, your authenticity. You've left your original teacher. You're making, you're making it up on your own. You can't do that just because you read a text, right? So Dharma Sagara, this is his critique of the Karatara Gacha. And uh, he said, Jinnavalaba was not initiated into his own lineage. He made it up, right? So that's it's pretty profound statement to make. And as you see in bullet point number four, the next claim was that the Tapa Gacha, so the, the Gacha that Jagachandra Suri founded, was the only uninterrupted lineage that goes all the way back to Mahavira, right? Now, how can the Tapa Gacha prove that, that Jagachandra Suri was really the 44th teacher in line with Mahavira? According to this, the Jagachandra's tapas, right? Jagachandra Suri's tapas, his austerities prove his descent. Because he was so powerful in austerities, he must be connected to Mahavira, right? So you can see that even though that's not a evidence-based claim that can prove that he's connected to Mahavira, for the Jains and for those in the Tapagacha, it was enough to suggest that he was in direct line with Mahavira because he was so powerful in his austerities in his ascetic practice. And as a result of this, the Tapa Gacha remains among the Shvetambaras, the most dominant Gacha all the way into the present. Okay, so how I mentioned before that in the North, as all this is happening and in the medieval period, Islam becomes, starts to colonize and come into India from the north, right? And that causes a stir among all the traditions and all the people who live in North India because you have uh, yet another invading presence, religious and political presence coming into your country or coming into what was then, you know, your land and making claims and make and destroying pilgrimage sites and destroying religious life. Uh, and, and with the Jains, the relationship was ambivalent because sometimes the Muslims were friendly to the Jains, as you see in bullet point number one, and sometimes they were not. Muslims destroyed, as you see in bullet point number two, a lot of Jain temples, but also, as Dundas points out, at times they rebuilt them or restored them back to the Jain community. Jain bankers also, Jain, a lot of Jains are bankers even to this day or work in finance. <clears throat> 
also worked closely in some cases with the Muslims by holding their capital to fund the Muslim exploits, right? So the Jane Bankers sort of passively held on to the money of the of the Muslim empire and those who were coming in from the Islamic empire. And that money then funded the Muslim exploits of North India, right? So we can see that even to this day, uh, some Jains will participate in particular forms of industry, for example, making parts, I think Dundas points this out, making certain parts that will end up being used in weapons, the Jains wouldn't be so concerned that the parts that they're creating may end up being used in weapons, as long as they themselves are not creating the weapons themselves, right? Or Jains will work in certain forms of jewelry or, or the trade of jewels or diamonds that obviously are connected to some form of violence, but they themselves are not performing the violence, right? So the Jains are, are sort of passively performing these activities but then it is the Muslims who are then taking them and in this particular case, taking the finance and, and exploiting and going through and conquering North India, right? So in that way, there's, there was sort of a, a, a synergistic relationship between these Jain bankers and the Muslims. Nevertheless, in 782, as you see in the fourth bullet point, Turkish Muslims came in and destroyed Vallabi, right? Vallabi, as you recall, was the city where the third council was held on the west coast in Gujarat at an important coastal trade center. And the Jains, a lot of Jains lived there, right? Well, the Muslims came in where the Jains had taken their commercial role and they destroyed the city, right? In the 13th and 14th century, so much later, the Jains became slaves to Muslims. Some Jains became slaves to Muslims as they came in to dominate North India. And in 1526, there's a bit of a change because the uh, Babu arrives with the great Mughal empire that will rule North India for a very long time, right? And Babur's grandson, nevertheless, Akbar, was very moved by a Tapa Gacha monk, the Tapa Gacha being the one founded by Jagachandra Suri, who did great uh, austerities that were really well respected, right? Akbar, the son, uh, the grandson of Babur of the Mughal Empire, was actually very moved by a Tapa Gacha monk who said that religion means that we should have compassion for all forms of life, right? So this commitment to nonviolence and compassion for all forms of life was seen as something worth respecting and it moved Akbar. He, he really appreciated that. And so what we can see throughout the history with Muslims, sometimes things went well, sometimes things did not go so well. Uh, but the Jains nevertheless continued to influence the Muslims in ways that would at least carry the religious tradition forward and express, as you see here in the last bullet point, the fundamental commitment to nonviolence. To the right here, you see an image of Tarun Sagar. Tarun Sagar is actually a Digambara monk, not a Shvetambara monk, but I bring him up because he, while he was alive, he, he passed away not too long ago, but while he was alive, he was involved in, in Indian politics quite a bit. He would show up on TV in Indian politics. And just to give you a sense of how these relations with Muslims carry forward into the presence, I read you this quote from India TV. There's a growing population of the Muslims, or the growing population of the Muslims is a threat to the nation, says Jain Muni Tarun Sagar, right? So we can see here that there is a religion of nonviolence, right? And then there are very powerful people within this religion of nonviolence, the Jain tradition, who are still speaking to the, to the relations with Muslims and even here at a political level. So you have a political you have a Jain monk who is involving himself in the discourse within Indian politics and speaking to Muslims as a threat to the nation. And in doing so, there's a much longer history to this. He's aligning himself with Hindu nationalist sentiments towards Muslims that see them as an invading presence that are still, uh, a pre and they are still a presence in India. They, they've been settled there for a very long time, obviously, but there's still this fundamental tension between those who imagine India as a fundamentally Hindu nation state and those who see it as more of a, 
social secular democracy, right? So certain parts of the Jain tradition, certain leaders within the Jain tradition, such as Turun Sagar, are getting on board or were on board or were supporting that Hindu nationalist state, which saw India as, as fundamentally uh, comprised of, of, of this Vedic tradition as well as the Jain tradition that went along with it. Okay, so I just point that out to show that, that, and we'll look at this in the future, that within the Jain tradition, there are certain forms of violence, and we've talked about it before with Jain kingship, where it is possible if one feels threatened to invoke what is known as virodi himsa, which is the himsa, the, the violence of self-defense, right? So according to Tarun Sagar, he sees the Muslims as a threat. So in some ways, he's invoking that old ideal of virodi himsa, I feel threatened, I'm in this case, going to speak out against the Muslims, right? Which is problematic for many reasons that we can't discuss here, but we'll leave it at that, just to show that this is something that happens. And finally, we'll end here with a brief discussion of Shvetambara caste or Jati. Theoretically, Jains abandon caste, right? Fundamentally, Jains reject caste. Right? The idea that there's a hierarchy of class that you can be born into, for example, within the Vedic tradition. And part of the original intention of the Jain tradition, or part of what it was protesting against, was this hierarchy of class, this idea that you could be born as a priest, or born as a warrior, or born into a business family, and that's where you would stay for the rest of your life, and you couldn't move up or down within the structure. Jains theoretically reject and abandon that, just as Buddhists did, Nevertheless, realistically and practically, they maintain somewhat of a caste structure. Because economically, as we've discussed before, the Jains are aligned with that merchant caste within the Jain, within Vedic or Hindu or just Indic society more broadly. They belong to endogamous groups or they marry into endogamous groups where the main determinant between how one gets married is economic, right? So you marry into your same economic class, essentially, which is essentially within the merchant caste. And they have a very close relationship and working relationship with Hindus within that same merchant caste. And they will often intermarry, right? So there are marriages more fluid between the Jain tradition and the Hindu tradition. So although there is a rejection fundamentally of caste, right? Ultimately, Practically speaking on the ground, the marriage alliances and the alliances between people uh, both within the Jain community as well as with the Hindu community is determined by uh, economic place in society, right? Nevertheless, other than that, the idea of caste or jati does not play such a vital role today as it, as it may have before. The idea of, the other idea being that within the jati system, the caste system within India, you can't interact with members of the other classes or castes because you will become impure, that doesn't hold in the Jain tradition, right? So if you're born a priest in the Vedic tradition, you don't want to interact with particular members of lower castes or class because your purity will be made impure, right? Within the Hindu Vedic society. However, that's generally speaking, but within the Jain tradition, your purity is something that you achieve through your own hard work, through your aesthetic practice, through your moral behavior, something that you model, right? Of behaviors that you model purify you. So your behavior purifies you, not where you're born into the, in, in which social class that you're born into. And that's a fundamental distinction that we have to make between the Jain tradition and, or Jain traditions and Hindu traditions, right? That are, that are obsessed with caste and purity. Purity is earned in the Jain tradition, while in Hindu Vedic society, you're born into your purity based on your prior karma. So that's just a brief overview of caste within Jain religious practice today. And in this lecture, we've covered a lot of different things. We've, we've been trying to look at the early to medieval history of the Shvetambara tradition. We looked at some of the ways that people become respected within that tradition up to the year 1000 CE, we saw that most of the information we have comes from hagiography. And then after that, we have more reliable data that Dundas points out. We see the, arise, the arising of these gachas that are Karatara and Tapa gacha that are influential all the way into the present. And we also saw the tenuous relationships 
the ambivalent relationships with Muslims that remain active all the way into the present. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.